All right. Welcome to the Quincy Institute's panel discussion on how to wind down the war on terror. My name is Trita Parsi. I'm the executive vice president of the Quincy Institute, a think tank in Washington that promotes ideas that move US foreign policy away from endless war and towards rigorous diplomacy. The war on terror is in its 19th year and there are no signs of it ending. But two things are increasingly clear. First, the US will not be able to defeat jihadist threats over there as long as US interventions inflame civil conflicts and inadvertently contribute to the dysfunctions of the host governments. Secondly, the fact that the US has been successfully uh, attacked only once by a foreign jihadist since 9-11 is mainly due to investments in domestic defenses rather than US foreign operations within the global war on terror. In a new Quincy paper released today, Steve Simon and Richard Sokolsky present a case for why and how the war on terror must come to an end. We have an excellent panel that will discuss the paper and its conclusions and recommendations. Our moderator is none other than Pulitzer Prize winner Eric Schmidt of the New York Times, who has a long and distinguished career covering international affairs and terrorism for the New York Times. For those of you who are joining us by Zoom, as always, please use the Q&A function in order to ask your questions and Eric will get to those throughout the conversation. If you are watching this on Facebook, put your questions in the comment section and we will try to get to those as well. So with no further ado, please welcome Eric who will introduce the panelists and kickstart the conversation. Eric. Thank you very much, Trita. And it's great to be here today uh, on Zoom and greetings to everybody who's uh, coming into this panel. I just wanted to introduce our our panelists today who will be speaking. Uh, first is Dan Benjamin, who is the John Sloan uh, Dickey, uh, the, chair, the director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth College, uh, former State Department official. Uh, Karen Breen Greenberg, uh, who is the, uh, the director of the Center on, Center on National Security at Fordham Law. And Stephen Simon, who's professor, professor of international relations at Colby College. Uh, in this, the timing of this, a panel, obviously, uh, it couldn't be better, I think, today, if you look around what's happening in, in Baghdad, for instance, in, in Iraq, uh, there is the beginning of the U.S. strategic dialogue uh, with Iraq on this, one of these very topics, is just what should be the commitment uh, of American forces in Iraq after the long-standing uh, commitment there. And Stephen, maybe you could start us off with a discussion a little bit uh, about the major themes in your very provocative paper, and particularly, You've argued here in your paper that the U.S. should actually reduce, continue to reduce even further than the levels they are now, U.S. counterterrorism forces in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, Somalia. Um, and yet, many would argue that these forces are already very small given the threat that's out there, the threat that's uh, maybe uh, you're not seeing the ISIS campaign anymore. It's not a full-fledged campaign, but still thousands of fighters and guerrilla fighters and the ideology of ISIS and Al-Qaeda are still quite vibrant. Yeah. Stephen, maybe you could address that starting off. Sure. Uh, it, the, it's, first of all, it's difficult to sort out uh, the CT presence, the counterterrorism presence that we have in our uh, broader forward deployed footprint uh, from everyone else. Uh, so, uh, right off the bat, you have a sort of, um, in a sense, an accounting problem. Like, who actually do you uh, withdraw? Um, I do think that, I, I do agree with you that the number of CT specific uh, forces have been reduced over time, and that the vast bulk of the US military presence in the region, which remains quite large, um, uh, it's mostly focused on a putative Iranian threat. So, um, you know, you've got this very large body of forces. You have a small number of troops within it who are allocated to the counterterrorism um, uh, mission. But the thing is that these troops um, uh, are embedded, in a sense, organically. Uh, and in terms of their responsibilities in this larger force, so which has other responsibilities. So actually pulling them out is a little bit tricky, even if you can figure out who exactly you might want to um, uh, pull out. It's really a question um, 
uh, from our perspective, that is myself and my co-author uh, in this paper, that the, that, the, that the troops that are committed to the CT mission should be, first of all, redeployed such that they're less likely to attract fire themselves. Secondly, that the role that they play in a counterterrorism context should be more um, explicitly aligned with the actual threat posed, that, that is the threat posed to the United States um, by the terrorists uh, whom they target. This is a very important point because if, you're, if your target set, if the, if, if, if the enemy as you define it is very broadly construed, uh, then you need a larger counterterrorism presence because you just, you need to hit more targets. But if you skinny that target set down a bit to um, uh, individuals or groups that have both the intention and capability and the plans to attack the United States at home, then I think you're going after a much smaller um, uh, a target set and you're in a position to actually reduce the forces that you have specifically focused on the counterterrorism threat. Now, you know, in terms of redeploying the counterterrorism forces um, uh, that we have in the region, the Pentagon has actually thought about this um, uh, quite a bit. And they had come up with a provisional plan for establishing nodes from which counterterrorism, uh, U.S. counterterrorism forces could sortie out to deal with uh, imminent threats. But, uh, you know, that process uh, was never brought to a conclusion, at least in the last uh, administration. So it hasn't really been, um, uh, and it hasn't been pursued since. So I think, you know, so you have ultimately... A, you have, these so you have a smaller American footprint um, but that also gets to one of your other points. And Dan, I wanted to see if you could uh, jump in here and talk a little bit about how scaling back on partner capacity uh, kind of syncs with this, because you, you clearly see that's one of the arguments right now for getting out of Iraq, getting out of Afghanistan is, okay, we'll have a smaller American presence and we're gonna rely more on the host nation to take over security forces. But Dan, in your former job at the State Department coordinating counterterrorism missions, this must have been a kind of a balancing act. You were working with all the time with your Pentagon partners and of course with the, with the host nations, just how capable are they given the threats that could emanate from those countries that could affect, you know, that could come back to hurt the United States or American interests. Uh, thanks, Eric. No, that's, uh, that's absolutely true. And of course, the, uh, the collapse of Iraqi forces in uh, 2014 uh, uh, under the weight of the attack, uh, attacks by ISIS you know, um, are a reminder that uh, um, these things can really surprise you uh, a great deal. And um, I'm really very sympathetic with a lot of the points that um, Steve makes in his uh, paper. Uh, and, and I think that they're, they're all headed in the right direction. I, I, I guess my caveat is that uh, um, you know, it's, it's events that always uh, will intercede and, and uh, uh, disturb uh, the, the, the best laid strategies. And so that's, that's just going to be a challenge going forward that, that uh, doesn't detract from uh, the point. But um, I, I think one of the other things that I would uh, raise here is the capacity building. I think we're going to be in that business for a long time. It's always uh, a somewhat challenging um, activity because as uh, uh, Steve points out, uh, sometimes we wind up involved with forces who are, um, uh, you know, doing more harm than good that are uh, not respecting human rights. Uh, I remember one country in particular, we spoke about that they, they practice counterterrorism with a chainsaw instead of a scalpel. And that's not a good way to go. But um, one other area where we might strengthen our hand is by beefing up what we're doing on the civilian side. So there are lots of countries that are authoritarian where our engagement uh, is gonna be uh, limited at, at best, but there are a number of countries too where working with uh, police, with uh, the judicial system, um, where we can make a significant impact. 
So, um, you know, I, I hope that there will be an emphasis on that going forward as well. Karen, the, um, the, the, not only is the, the war on terror nearly 20 years old, but so are some of the main authorities for that. And uh, Congress has been wrestling with trying to get an AUMF through or some, some part of that. I want to get your view on that. And I want to tie it into a question that's come in because it's kind of the, it's, it's on point to this too. It's to what extent do you believe that U.S. administration might be amenable to the recommendations of this paper um, and given the presence in the U.S. in various countries has actually been focused on other interests such as containing Iran rather than anti-terrorism itself? To what extent is the AUMF in its you know, form, has it been stretched so paper thin now uh, that this administration is using it perhaps in ways that the legislators never intended it for? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, the AUMF, as you say, is, is as long as the war on terror that was launched or, you know, for us on September 11th. Um, so let me just answer the, the first part of, you know, has it been stretched too thin? Um, you know, the intention originally in the AUMF, there was an extra sentence that was gave the president extraordinary powers to sort of um, counter any aggressor that he thought rose to the level of needing a military response or some kind of response of force. And that was taken out before Congress passed it. But in a way, that's what's happened to the AOMF. It has increasingly been used against Al Qaeda and associated forces and in many countries around the world because it was not defined geographically, temporally, or even in terms of really the enemy, other than tying it to 9-11 in a broad way. So it's not surprising that the AOMF has been used by successive presidents to, to counter, you know, um, forces that are more and more removed from the actual attacks of 9-11. However, the, the ability of Congress to come up with a new AUMF that to replace that or to sunset this one has you know, not succeeded. And so um, now we're left in a situation and you asked the question, you know, and, and it's asked in the paper, can we have a new AUMF? And instead, I think, Steve, in your paper, um, you raised the, um, the possibility of not a new AOMF, but a war powers, a new war powers act. You know, we just tried a war powers act to limit the presidential authority against Iran and it failed last month. You know, we couldn't, uh, the Senate was not able to override the presidential veto. So I think there are two questions here. One, in an ideal world, could we sunset the AOMF that was launched in the fall of 2001 and say, look, as this paper argues, the war on terror, as we understood it, has come to the end of a certain period of time. Yes, pieces of this will go on, but we need to say, we've come to the end of that moment and let's talk about how we go for, forward to manage the threat, to counter the threat in a way that recognizes some of the accomplishments that have been made in the region. And as this paper points out, some of the limitations to what the United States can actually achieve by military force in terms of creating some kind of peaceful environment. Have, could any resolution that constrained presidential powers in this environment pass? I'm not so sure. So my so I'm assuming this paper, one of the questions in my mind for this paper was, so which administration are you pitching this to? For this administration, I think um, in the amount of time left, the war powers resolution, as you suggested, would not pass in a um, in, a, in a new administration with a different president, um, it might have a chance. Um, but I would say that maybe there are some lessons learned that you allude to throughout the paper that you haven't um, exactly identified, which is that the language needs to be specific, that the, that the breadth of the powers needs to be specific from the beginning. We didn't just get here for no reason. So um, just we can have another panel on how to write that war powers resolution. But I think in this environment, it's very hard. In a future environment, it could happen. But, but the first thing that you'd have to do is to educate the American people into the meme that goes throughout this paper, which is that the war on terror, as we know it, has come to a, to a point at which we're starting a, a very different new chapter. And by the way, let me just say, there's no two better people to think about this than age of sacred terror um, people who explained this to us at the beginning, Dan and Steve. So it's in their ballpark, <laughs> in their court. <laughs> Eric, if I can just jump in here. Uh, I, uh, I agree with just about everything Karen said. I have to say that uh, 
when we look at how every part of our government has dealt with the terrorism challenge, uh, I think few have fallen down quite so dramatically as Congress. And um, that has to do with sort of reorganizing their committees to deal with this in a reasonable sort of way, instead of having everyone testify before 20 different committees and so on and so forth. But the, the possibility of Congress, any foreseeable Congress in the near future, uh, actually producing a new AUMF or you know, sunsetting the old one, producing a new War Powers Act is so slim that it is, um, as a political matter, just deeply, deeply depressing. Maybe, maybe there will be an earthquake in November, but um, that will produce a different kind of Congress. But this has just been a problem for so long. I mean, Barack Obama wanted a different AUMF, but uh, there was no way to, you know, get a Congress all lined up to do it. The, I want to go to a question here because it gets to a, the larger issue of where are the priorities uh, from the national security standpoint. <clears throat> of course, <clears throat> this administration came in uh, with a new with a new renewed focus on China and Russia's great power competition, also focusing on North Korea and Iran, of course, and terrorism. Um, but the questioner asks here: How can the next administration balance troop reduction in the Middle East with foreign aid, diplomacy, and development? to address root causes of terrorism. So the Middle East is still gonna be a focus here, Stephen, isn't it? Is, even in your paper and obviously with your background in this issue? Yeah, I think inescapably it would be uh, something of a focus because the, the issue of uh, Iran's uh, regional objectives and Iran's nuclear objectives uh, now remain uh, unresolved. Uh, in part because the United States uh, under the Trump administration withdrew from the nuclear deal that the United States and other countries had negotiated uh, with Iran. And I think it, as, as long as that conflict is unresolved, uh, the United States uh, is going to be um, uh, is going to be caught up in things there. Uh, as I think I mentioned, you know, most of our forces in the region are all geared um, uh, to this uh, uh, to this Iranian threat. And uh, and I, I use that term advisedly uh, to the, the, the number of troops is geared uh, to the prospect of uh, potential conflict with Iran that might arise in any number of, of ways. So, you know, um, we'll, have, we'll have troops there until the Iran issue is resolved, whether the, the, Biden, issue, whether the uh, Biden presidency would be able to uh, resolve those issues uh, is really unclear. Um, uh, the incentive for a Trump administration to make a change uh, in the U.S. maximum pressure policy towards Iran uh, in its second term. Uh, you know, I wouldn't rule it out, but it doesn't seem uh, uh, as though they'd be incentivized um, uh, to do that. So to be sure, the United States is going to be involved. But in, in terms of the root causes of terrorism, I mean, there, uh, Eric, uh, you know, I think we're um, uh, getting into deep waters. Um, uh, there isn't a consensus on the root causes of terrorism, in part because political violence, you know, violent radicalization is motivated by a number of different things in a number of different contexts. It's sort of situation uh, dependent, but to the extent that, um, uh, you know, there's political violence uh, running rampant in the Middle East, it owes largely to factors that the United States does not have the resources or the expertise um, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to resolve. I mean, very poor governance, ecological change, um, uh, malperforming uh, economies, uh, a labor supply overhang. I mean, there are just too many workers for, you know, too few jobs. Um, uh, the, the, the host of reasons uh, for political uh, violence in the Middle East it's just, it's really, it's really astounding. And, uh, and the situation is probably, you know, getting worse. So the United States, the United States, just as an example, couldn't deal effectively with Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> you know, that was on American soil. Um, 
uh, you know, it was a natural disaster that wrecked infrastructure uh, in the uh, in the area of New Orleans and 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 elsewhere along the Gulf of Mexico. So, um, you know, the idea that the United States is going to be able to uh, fix the problems in these countries that have radicalized many individuals uh, strikes me as really unlikely. And remember, the United States tried to do this uh, and really spent a lot of money in in and expended a lot of energy uh, in Afghanistan and, uh, and Iraq, just to name, you know, two countries that were the focus of US efforts and, and did not succeed. So I think, you know, you're setting the bar, you know, pretty high. And one of the reasons why the war on terror has uh, continued uh, for so long in the form that it has is that it's just, it's a lot easier to mow the lawn uh, than it is, uh, you know, to plant crops uh, in that in that soil. Would you expect a Biden administration to embrace uh, the the strategy that you're proposing? And what what what? I mean, Karen's kind of discounted, at least on the political side, chances for an AUMF, uh, even if there, I suppose if there's a Democratic Congress. But what about some of the other aspects? What do you think of, of your proposals and recommendations? Which have the best chance of of being embraced and succeeding under a, under a Biden administration, should he win? Uh, well, you know, this is, uh, I can only talk about this in a very speculative way. I mean, I really, you know, I really don't know, but I'd have thought uh, that to the extent they can reduce their military footprint in the region, uh, they will, um, uh, in part because the, the so-called rebalancing or pivot to Asia that began uh, early in the Obama administration, I think will, uh, will continue. I think that the uh, Biden administration will be very concerned about China and, and uh, the vice president has uh, made himself clear on this point already. He's very concerned about China. So I think, you know, there'll be a continued movement in that, uh, in that direction. And you can see the roiling uh, already within the Pentagon about how uh, forces uh, will be redeployed in that context. So, uh, uh, you know, looking at, for example, U.S. counterterrorism forces in, in Africa, particularly West Africa, um, you know, the Pentagon would like to move some of those to the Asian uh, theater of operations, but the Africa Command, you know, thinks that that's not a good idea. And there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a, a battle going on uh, about this. And it's a battle that needs to be that needs to be fought. But nevertheless, I think the next administration will be uh, as concerned about Asia as, uh, as both the Obama and the, and the Trump administrations um, uh, were. So I think they'll be receptive. I think there'll be budgetary pressures owing to COVID. You know, this is, the United States has, has undertaken a, a colossal uh, debt um, uh, in order to prevent uh, economic collapse in the context of, of this COVID thing. And that's gonna have an effect on appropriations for defense. Uh, well, well, Dan and, and Karen, let, let me use that point to kind of pivot because I did wanna ask about the impact on COVID-19 as many uh, scholars, national security scholars are looking at, will this redefine uh, national security going forward, whether it's a Trump administration or a Biden administration after November's election? I realize everything is very much in flux, uh, but I'd like to hear from both of you on kind of what you think the impact of COVID-19 might be on defining the challenges moving ahead and how a, a counterterrorism uh, priority fits into that. Dan, you want to start off? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, a lot will depend on who the president is. Um, and uh, I think it's worth uh, pointing out that if anyone, any other conceivable person had been uh, in the White House right now, uh, COVID-19 as a foreign policy issue would be, uh, would loom much, much larger. I mean, it's really quite an extraordinary thing uh, how limited the resources are that we have devoted to helping uh, other countries uh, deal with this issue. And uh, I mean, if you just look back to 2014 through 17, the, the uh, 2014 through 16 and the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, you know, it's a whole different approach. And I, I, uh, I have a feeling that if uh, there is a Biden administration and if we see the kind of um, 
infection rates that are being projected in the developing world for the summer and the fall, you know, I think you'll see a different kind of look. As a security matter, I think um, it is less uh, urgent than uh, great power competition, which is the flavor of the day at the Pentagon and uh, in the foreign policy establishment. And so um, I, I uh, think that that is what will, you know, be the gravitational pull uh, in the next uh, few years. But having said that, um, you know, the, in many ways, the most important thing in uh, reconfiguring uh, counterterrorism policy may be uh, po political leaders' sense of vulnerability. So, you know, I think that we still have antibodies, if you will, uh, to uh, terrorism in a way that will uh, cause any uh, politician to think, oh, my God, what if this, what if, you know, what if there's a big attack and I'm not ready? Um, and appropriately so. So I think it's going to be a, a, a challenge to draw down as much. I think um, that beneath the surface, although we're all worried about great power competition, COVID-19, and all the scandals of the Trump administration, uh, if, if suddenly there were a resurgence in global terrorism, uh, we would see uh, you know, a replay of, of earlier times. And most of your colleagues uh, at the Times and the Post would get reassigned uh, back to terrorism, which they were covering before. So um, I, I think all those issues are uh, big. I do think that great power competition and the pivot to Asia will be determinative of the, of the you know, major trends going forward. Karen, how do you feel that COVID-19, well, how will that change the, yeah. the, the place of counterterrorism? It's already been kind of diminished in this national defense strategy, security strategy. What, where, where does this leave it now? Yeah, well, first of all, I think COVID is having its own impact on terrorist groups and on the environments in when terrorist groups form, particularly in the Middle East and elsewhere. And so we don't know, we won't know till more reporting's in, but first of all, there have been, you know, um, large uh, numbers uh, uh, supposedly of deaths throughout due to COVID, um, but also it's a point of exploitation, which is, you know, um, ISIS recruiting in the COVID atmosphere or other terrorist groups recruiting in the COVID atmosphere. And a number of terrorism experts have been writing about this. You know, what's how is that going to play out to increasing the viability of these groups and the numbers in these groups? So we'll see how that plays out. What I do think has happened, which which actually had happened, I think, among nationals about security experts before, is that um, there needs to be more things prominently in the basket of um, security whether it's terrorism or not terrorism, these things are not so easily um, separable from one another. And so um, I noticed that the worldwide, the worldwide threat assessment is supposed to, that report usually comes out early in the year um, to the Intelligence Committee, House Intelligence Committee to discuss, hasn't happened this year. It was delayed before COVID. Um, and now of course, I'm sure COVID is the reason it's being used to be delayed, but seriously, um, there needs to be uh, some thoughtful, as I think this report is by the way, thoughtful um, sense of what are the uh, threats and what are the threats that we've missed. Biosecurity and bio, in the context of bioterrorism uh, was part of the Patriot Act. It was very uh, much a, a, um, a, an important thing for the Clinton administration, for the Obama administration and for the Bush administration. Where did it go? Right? So these are not new things. The same thing with climate change. And I just want to put something else on the radar here that when we're listing these things, I think the nation state, non state actor, um, sort of two baskets that we've had for our national security when we think about terrorism, I think these other things that are not geographically or politically defined that are climate change. Um, and um, you know, biosecurity issues, but also issue of uh, uh, displaced persons. That is one of the major things that is happening throughout um, the globe that I don't know how, what basket you put it in, but it infiltrates all of the things as does climate change. So what I'm really saying is what we don't have are thoughtful people that we've seen being willing to put out a terrorist threat uh, analysis, a worldwide threat assessment. And without that, for us to talk about how, how these are being evaluated, 
you know, we don't really, we're, we're in the dark. Um, and the second thing, just to the point about Katrina, is that I'm, I'm wondering, Steve, if you think that, or, or Dan, if you think that our institutions are up for this in the way we formulated as a country interagency processes, whole government answers, or do we need to rethink um, the institutional, uh, not just capacity, but in the institutions that we have to deal with the um, combination of threats that we have to face in the future? Well, I'll let Stephen answer that first and, and also answer a question that's come in from Gordon Adams. The underlying assumption here is that terrorism is a major threat and it is the US's job to either confront it uh, directly or train everyone else to confront it. It does not appear to directly threaten the US and we are not capable of training others to deal with it. Um, you know, this, this has come up recently, the whole issue about training partners uh, and something I think you flagged in your report was the Saudi gunman at Pensacola, Florida last December who shot and killed three sailors, somebody who the FBI and Justice Department acknowledged just a few weeks ago had been in contact with AQAP operatives two years before he even came to the United States and was in contact with them uh, from the time he started training in the US uh, in 2017, right up until the night before he carried out that fatal attack. Um, Stephen, I mean, we can address that specific issue about that's kind of a path of radicalization that's obviously a concern here infiltrating the United States, uh, but also address the, the larger question here that uh, was posed. Okay, um, uh, a set of complicated issues. Uh, uh, first, uh, to, to Karen's point, uh, the United States government isn't especially well organized uh, to deal uh, with these kinds of issues. And, you know, there's a reason for that. Inertia, uh, of course, is one, uh, but another is the way in which the congressional committee system is, is organized uh, and the willingness of uh, congressmen to um, uh, see responsibilities so that, uh, you know, they now uh, uh, bestride uh, given to other new committees. It's just, it gets politically uh, too complicated. Personalities get involved. It's really something. I mean, look at, look at how hard it was to set up the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. That, was, that was extremely tough. Uh, and it was extremely tough from a congressional point of view. Yet it turned out at the end of the day to be the right thing to do. Um, uh, and an incredibly important thing to do, even if it took 10 years for that agency to mature. Um, uh, and it still has a lot of flaws, there's no doubt about it, uh, but it's been crucial in, uh, in helping defend the United States against the kinds of threats that we're talking about. And it's uh, one of the principal reasons that we haven't seen attacks uh, in this country by foreign jihadists, except for this Pensacola attack uh, that Eric just mentioned, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, what, you know, your, your kind of unified field theory of, of threats um, uh, is, is well taken. But when it comes to terrorism, I think we really have to ask ourselves, threat to whom and under what circumstances okay so um uh, do isis fighters in uh, uh in northeastern uh syria or does uh, um, uh an, an al-qaeda related fighter in north uh, western syria do they pose some kind of threat to the united states that is the core threat to the united states and that's something, you know, that, you know, from my perspective, is highly questionable. But you, you, you need to think it through in order to gear your response. And, you know, the United States strategy on counterterrorism is sensibly, you know, a multi-tiered strategy, right? I mean, it's sort of like an onion that you can unpeel. You know, the outer layer, you have these four deployed U.S. forces that we're talking about. Um, uh, and... And closer to the center of the onion, you have DHS and FBI and, you know, the, a host of law enforcement and other capacities um, and border controls that, uh, you know, help keep us safe. And that's, and that's really great. So the, the question is, so what happens if you peel the outer layer of the onion off a bit and you lay off a bit um, on, on this, uh, on the forward deployed presence? And that's where we get to Pensacola. Uh, and the issue of safe havens, 
okay? Because when when you look at the um, at the explanations that uh, professionals provide, uh, that is our our colleagues in Washington who are very engaged in the counterterrorism mission, they're all serious people. They're all serious people and they think hard about this problem and they're really dedicated to their responsibilities, okay? So I'm not questioning any of that at all. But when one talks about the Ford deployed US presence, their, their response tends to be, well, there's this safe haven issue. So if you, if you leave territory that's not effectively governed or it's governed by folks you don't like, unoccupied by US forces, well, into that vacuum will flow uh, terrorists who um, uh, immune to interference because they're in a safe haven can plot uh, attacks against the United States that can be very devastating. Okay, that's, that's sort of the idea. Now the Pensacola attack, which is the only foreign, as far as I know, the only foreign jihadist attack against the United States since 9-11 that was successful. Um, uh, was, that, was that hatched, was that plot hatched uh, in a safe haven that could have been eliminated by forward deployed US forces? I mean, in this case, the safe haven <laughs> was the Saudi Air Force. Um, so, uh, you know, is, is, are, are we going to launch uh, drone raids against the headquarters of the Saudi Air Force, you know, because that is a safe haven? Or, you know, terrorists who attacked Londoners and, 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 and Spanish commuters in 2004, 2005, 2007, and, and, and uh, follow-on attacks in Brussels and Paris and Marseille, where, where was the safe haven that these killers launched from? Well, their safe havens were Brussels, Marseille, Paris, London, Madrid, uh, and, 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 and so forth. So, um, you know, I just, I just sort of questioned the validity of uh, the safe haven rationale for the need for the U.S. to be out in the region holding on to territory mm -hmm. and controlling territory in the way uh, that, they, that they do. And to the Pensacola um, attack, Eric, uh, you know, specifically, I mean, it was quite a remarkable thing uh, in that the one successful attack comes from uh, a U.S. security partner. Now, this I'm not blaming the Saudi government for this. Um, uh, you know, they missed it. Okay, so they, they you know, they, they missed it. They certainly had no part in directing the attack. I mean, this guy uh, was a bad actor um, uh, that really hated the United States, and he took advantage of, of uh, his, he sought his position. Um, so that he could gain access to the United States and kill servicemen, you know, American um, uh, military personnel uh, on an American base in the United States. Well, that's, you know, that's not an attack that you foil with forward deployed forces. That's an attack that you foil uh, with Homeland Security and all its related um, uh, tools and skills. Well, that gets to another question from a, from a viewer it says, and Dan, maybe, maybe you can take a first crack at this. Do you agree that the risks and threat to overall U.S. interests have shifted away from Islamic terrorism and that strategically resources have to be directed to new threats, whether these new threats are cyber threats, whether they're from white supremacist group, uh, or as Karen was suggesting before, other things, bio, biochemi uh, things, things obviously that have been a concern and you, you both have written, all have written about it in the past, but uh, where should that focus be? And is this paper kind of directed on the right topics? Um, well, a few points. Yes, I think we're overinvested in the terrorist threat in terms of the resources that are available. I think that Steve makes that uh, point very effectively in his paper. I think it's been true for uh, a few years now. Um, uh, you know, I would, uh, I, I would, at the same time, stipulate 
uh, and I think I think Steve agrees with this that, uh, and I think Karen does too. The terrorist threat's not going away; um, it's going to ebb and flow um, because of all the dysfunctionalities uh, in uh, countries where we see the highest rates of radicalization, and it's going to continue because there are going to be, as a statistical matter, a certain number. Uh, of alienated people domestically who are going to interpret the world through the prism of jihad jihadist or other terrorist ideologies and they're gonna take action, but the numbers will remain small and, and the threat remains manageable. I do think that, um, you know, Steve has spoken eloquently about what the forward deployed troops um, cannot do and what, um, you know, our homeland security uh, apparatus does do. I think one of the things that uh, is going to be essential in uh, keeping the threat level low and maintaining the security of Americans and to a certain extent of our allies, uh, because the intelligence community provides this service uh, globally, is that, you know, we're gonna have to maintain high investments in intelligence. And uh, the, um, the fact that the Saudi Air Force uh, shooter got through, you know, is uh, uh, an indication of one of the kinds of blind spots uh, that we find every few years. And that's, well, that's going to continue to be the case. Um, but I think that, um, you know, we can, uh, we can manage this if we maintain those investments and we maintain a bureaucratic, you know, emphasis on, uh, identifying bad actors before they come to our shores, or in the case of the work of the FBI, bad act, you know, people who are here who are radicalizing and who are uh, uh, dangerous. But there's no question that from, uh, you know, in the aughts and the, and the teens, we were heavily, heavily invested in counterterrorism uh, at a time when uh, a lot of other things were developing, and in particular, great power rivalry was was resurging, you know, and so um, I do expect a greater diversification uh, when it comes to uh, resource allocation in the future. Yeah. Karen, what about the different kinds of threats, be they cyber, be they from domestic homegrown terrorists, white supremacists? One of the questions here is, you know, how can we ensure the definition of terrorism and counterterrorism is, is either not expanded so much that they lose its, it loses its meaning and loses its focus? Um, uh, we've got to go this this wide range of threats. Um, what should that definition be today? The definition of terrorism or yeah. a threat? And, and, and countering it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it I changes. think that's the question. How do we define, how do we narrow the definition of terrorism and narrow the, the definition of, of how to counter it? And as I said, we missed the chance with the original AUMF and now's the time to maybe think about that. The way the government does it now is with designating foreign terrorist organizations. And you know we have different ways of dealing with it uh, domestically, but I wanna just emphasize something that, that Steve brought up in his report. It's not just a misuse of resources. It's not just throwing too many resources at a problem that we don't need anymore. He's, he's making a different argument. Steve, you can tell me I'm, I'm wrong, but this is what I read. It's that we're actually contributing in some ways to some of the problems in the greater in the greater region. So for example, destabilization of, of, of societies we're making that worse, not better. Um, you make the point um, that um, that you make the point about uh, drone attacks. That the number of drone attacks, which you don't say this, but has escalated immensely, needs to be done in a much more targeted way, in a much more specific way. And Eric, get, this gets to the question of who is a terrorist and what is an imminent threat. And I think what goes throughout Steve's thing is not so much can we name the terrorist groups, but can we name the terrorist threat, which is who actually threatens us and in what ways. <laughs> And that does apply across the board, whether it's white supremacist terrorists, whether it's cyber terrorists. Have we made our, our basket of definitions across the board in terms of enemies so broad that we're unable to, to specify in a way that helps us deter in a focused and resource wise way? And I think this report, without stating that that's one of the takeaways, to me was one of the best takeaways from the report. So. 
What's Stephen? What's the, is the author of that report now? What's the challenge in trying to kind of marshal public opinion or at least focus uh, so the public now understands this this shifting threat, so that the so it can put pressure on its representatives to resource that better. That's a great question, um, uh, Eric, and I, I think I have to revert here to something that uh, that Dan. Uh, said earlier, which is that it's fundamentally a political issue. Yeah. Um, and uh, right now, you know, there are a number of moral hazards uh, at work, uh, you know, for politicians. Um, uh, the one is no, no politician for perfectly understandable reasons uh, wants uh, uh, a terrorist attack against the United States to succeed on uh, her or his watch. Nobody, nobody wants that. Um, so, uh, you know, given the political risk that that sort of thing would entail, well, if you have to keep, you know, throwing resources uh, at, um, uh, at programs that may only tangentially uh, relate to the threat that you're worried about. Um, so you just, you just do it. Uh, but in the process, of course, uh, you also stoke public perceptions uh, of, uh, uh, of a severe threat that's out there, maybe more severe than it actually is, but you're stoking those perceptions. But you're also stoking the perception that actually um, there can be some kind of perfect defense you know that the other guy won't get under the wire and um, you know your enemy won't get under the wire and the thing is you know as both Karen and, and Dan said um, yeah, that's something that no one can ever guarantee. Somebody's going to get through. And this Pensacola thing was a great example because it's not as though the Saudis lack a domestic intelligence agency uh, that surveils its citizens, but they do, uh, and they miss this. And uh, in the United States, as you as you pointed out in your recap um, of that of that episode, this guy had been talking to Al Qaeda on his iPhone for two years up to the minute before the attack. Now, you know, um, yeah, everybody, you know, Amazon, Google, you know, they all probably <laughs> were monitoring this guy's co communications, um, you know, probably pretty carefully for their own commercial reasons. But the United States, you know, the law enforcement had no reason to be uh, monitoring his communications. They didn't, so they missed it, and he, and he snapped one off. And he, and he, and he tragically killed three uh, sailors, you know, in, in, in Pensacola. But, you know, again, re reverting to something Dan said, I mean, okay, that sort of thing happens. You, you, it, it helps you pinpoint a vulnerability, at which you then remedy. Um, but, but, the, but the notion that, you know, the public uh, can be brought to accept a reasonable degree of risk is, is a troubling one. Um, and it, it's in part because it's the way this particular risk is defined. So Americans are willing to accept school massacres that occur, um, uh, you know, with uh, some frequency and kill hundreds of children. So, um, you know, but Americans are more or less, you know, they're not okay with it. They don't, they don't like it, but it, for them, it's a risk that, well, you know, we just have to, we just have to accept and, you know, uh, access to particular kinds of weapons and so forth um, is more important than those, than those lives. Um, the threat of a terrorist attack is uh, construed quite differently uh, in part because of the way it's been packaged by, um, uh, by our political leaders, you know, um, but our political leaders don't have a great incentive really um, uh, to repackage uh, this, uh, uh, the risks in ways that might be better. The four of us have spent a lot of time over the last 20 years writing and thinking about this, but, but the three of you uh, teach, uh, you know, the next generation of, of scholars 
at your respective universities and colleges. And I'm wondering when you talk with them, how do they define this threat? And um, and and where what what are they most worried about? And uh, and and how can that opinion? How does that reflect perhaps in any of your your moving forward on these issues? Who do you want to hear? <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, so I have taught a seminar on uh, on terrorism uh, on and off for the last seven years, and um, it's actually quite interesting how uh, shrewd students can be, and and they um, um, you know have a have a very good understanding of um, uh, of how you know we over reacted in, in some critical ways after 9-11. There are not a lot of defenders of the invasion of Iraq around, uh, at least my campus, and I think that's probably true of all the others. Um, and, uh, you know, they uh, tend to shake their heads when they see how, um, how narrow the focus uh, of uh, foreign security policy became at various points and how difficult it was when someone like uh, President Obama tried to break out of that uh, prism. And, and I think we all remember how, you know, whenever he would say things that, you know, suggested that we needed to right size our perception of the terrorist threat, he got, you know, really attacked in very, in very uh, harsh partisan terms. Um, at the same time, you know, I think they're also, um, uh, clued in to the political sensitivity of the issue. And one of the things uh, that I ask my students to do is, um, for example, do the mental exercise, do the, uh, uh, do the experiment. What happens if there is uh, one or two or three states that collapse in West Africa because of the rise of uh, jihadist groups? You know, it's a place that we're quite worried about now. Um, it, West Africa has, you know, we have lots of interests there, but it's never been defined as an area of uh, American vital interest. What, what will the U.S. government do? And uh, you can certainly imagine a stampede on the hill to say, "Oh my God, that you know, what what starts in Guinea will end in in uh, in Staten Island." So um, uh, I think that uh, you know we're all kind of uh, you know marveling at this this disconnect, uh, you know, that it's not, uh, it's, it doesn't threaten Americans imminently at the same time Americans feel profoundly threatened. You know, four years ago, here, I'm in New Hampshire, four years ago, uh, we had uh, candidates uh, uh, running all over New Hampshire, uh, literally talking to people in small towns up near the Canadian border about the imminence of the terrorist threat. And, um, you know, we have voters saying, I'm worried they're going to break into my house, you know, up in Berlin, New Hampshire. Uh, this is an absurdity. And yet uh, it's still underneath the surface, it's there. People are worried about other things right now, but I do not believe that that is gone. And that I think, you know, underscores the political volatility of the issue. You know, I have, what about a, little, you? I have a little, um, um, long-term perspective on this because I've been teaching terrorism essentially since 9-11 and I think the student perception has actually gotten much different that there was a sense that it was definable that they knew what it was and that they were much more terrified of a terrorist attack in the earlier days it's interesting now to watch a kind of there's like a free-floating fear kind of what you're talking about Dan to me that's more of a free-floating fear that they found something to attach it to when I raise cybersecurity issues to my students they're not it's hard to get them as concerned as I think a lot of us older people are I'm not quite sure how to get them worried about it but I do think that getting back to your original question Eric COVID is going to change our students and the population in general sense of risk and of threat. And I think it's a really important time to sort of take this on for us and others in sort of sort of leadership. How do we think about risk? Um, nobody was ever under the impression that COVID wouldn't kill tens of thousands of American citizens. To compare that to what Steve said about our tolerance for what would happen with a terrorist attack. And so I think, um, 
Um, I think we need to think about this and I think it's changing. And so I expect my students this year to be very different than students for the past 19 years. Stephen, what happens in your campus in the fall when this issue comes up, however you however you're gonna have your, your classes, if you've decided, if Colby's decided yet? I think, it, look, I teach Middle Eastern history and political economy, so it's just, um, there's, there's not going to be um, uh, a lot about this in my classes, I, su I suppose, but I, but, but, but I agree with Karen that, that if, if anything is going to grip students' interests, it's going to be this, because um, COVID has completely disrupted the lives of these students. And uh, as, as we all know, in, a, in, a, in an immediate and powerful way, 9-11 terrorism, I mean, my freshmen were born after 9-11, yeah. you know, for them, you know, it could have been the war of 1812. It's just, it, it, it's just not, uh, not an immediate concern and precisely because the United States hasn't been attacked uh, in some dramatic way by foreign jihadists uh, during the entire period of their, you know, emergence to maturity uh, and arrival in college. It's just not something that, you know, that they're really, that they're really focused on. COVID though, <laughs> that's going to be a different story. Yeah. Well, Can I we're, just add uh, something to we're, that? We're, can I just add one thing to Steve, just that sure. the, the thing about COVID is that, you know, you write a lot, you say it a lot in your report, we were going to take the war on terror over there. And we did, you know, do that to a large extent. We can't do that with COVID. And so I think what COVID has sort of also underscored is the fact that Americans live in the world and all of its threats. And so I think we need, you know, in the future, we're going to be addressing that in a different way as well. Great. We're going to have to end it there, but I want to thank uh, the panelists and I want to turn it back over to Trita for final comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Eric, Karen, uh, Daniel, and Stephen for a fantastic conversation. We live in a time in which clearly uh, opportunity and necessity of rethinking a lot of different <laughs> things. In the case of uh, the war on terror, clearly it should have been uh, rethought much, much earlier. Uh, but nevertheless, an opportunity exists now, and I think this conversation definitely pushed it forward, and hopefully in the near future, there will also be the political opportunities to do something about that. Before I let everyone else go, just wanted to um, uh, mention the upcoming panels and webinars that we have uh, that we would love for you to participate in as well. On June 17th, uh, we will have a panel discussion titled The Liberal Order, Before Trump and After. Panelists will include QI fellow Patrick Porter, whose book, uh, uh, which will be released that same day, this conversation will center on, and the book is called The False Promise of Liberal Order. It will be including uh, Emma Ashford from Cato and Professor Michael Lind uh, from the University of Texas, who will be on that panel discussion as well. Then on June 25th, the, uh, which marks the 70th uh, anniversary of the start of the Korean War, we will have a panel titled The Legacy of the Korean War on U.S. Democracy, Economy, and Society. Speakers will include Congressman Ro Khanna and QI fellows Mary Dudziak and Nikhil Paul Singh. So if you haven't already, please make sure you go to quincyinst.org, sign up for our newsletter so you get notification for all of our events and papers that are coming out. Uh, and please share that with your friends as well. And finally, thank you so much for today and hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. This was excellent.